Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Kick Your Boots Up podcast. I'm your host, Taylor McAdams. We have a treat in store for you this week. This week's guest is a legend and truly really doesn't need any introduction, but for his sake and for yours, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about this guy sitting next to me. He's the 10-time NFR Bullfighter of the Year, which that alone says a lot. Um, but in, in my personal opinion, one of the coolest awards I've ever heard of him receiving is the 2022 Lane Frost Award at Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo. And that award is given annually to someone who has enhanced the image and the growth of the PRCA. And after his little accident in 2021 and the way he recovered, I feel like he was a really great recipient of that. Um, he's from Wyoming. You you know him, you love him. Ladies and gentlemen, Dusty Tuckness. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. It's so good to have you here in studio and to get to a little to know about your story a little bit. And so every everyone who's listened to the podcast very long knows that we start at the humble beginnings. It's mm -hmm. really big and really important to talk about how you got your start and what brought you here. So tell us a little bit about you and how you became a bullfighter. Yeah, so for me, I grew up into the rodeo world. Um, my mom is involved in rodeo. My dad fought bulls and you know, I was traveling around with him at a young age and <clears throat> in the summer of my early years and man, it just something that I was drawn to and <clears throat> kind of a long story short, I put his shoes on one day and never looked back. Wow. And did you ever think like, yeah, I actually want to try to be a bull rider or a bronc rider or a roper. <laughs> did you ever like really seriously go down that avenue? Um, I, I rode bulls a little bit. I think more or less just due to the fact it was you know, there was a lot of people around me that were kind of taking that route, but, uh, and it was something about the bullfighting that really drew me to the sport. And, you know, obviously, you know, dad was a bit advocate of that, you know, watching him and what he did in inside and outside the arena and just the whole concept of the bullfighter, you know, I think is, uh, one of the most selfless jobs out there. And, um, you know, I, as I look back now, <clears throat> I just feel that it was all part of God's plan for my life. And, there's a lot of highs and lows and U-turns at a, at a young age, but, uh, you know, it, it's turned out to be something pretty special. Um, at a young age, I don't think anybody realizes, you know, you always have dreams and things that you want to chase as a kid, and um, but at a young age, I don't think you really take a hold of what that could actually be like, and and so I spent a lot of time reflecting, looking back at that, that kid, and which keeps me motivated and in, in where I'm at in my career right now. So, um, yeah, it all started at a young age and, you know, it's developing something more than I could ever imagine. Been very blessed. Oh yeah. And you're really good about <clears throat> mindset and keeping a, a solid head on your shoulders throughout everything. And so I want to kind of go back a little bit to that, that time when you had first become a bullfighter, you were falling in your dad's footsteps. Did you ever feel a certain kind of, um, untalked about pressure from him? You know, I'm sure it was mm -hmm. like you wanted to do as good as your dad or better. So tell us about that. Yeah, so for me, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, growing up into it, I can honestly say I had two older, two older brothers that, uh, you know, I always wanted to do stuff with them, and in order for me to tag along, I had to kind of be tough. And, um, and, and just through the whole sport of rodeo, you kind of had to have a tough edge to you. But <clears throat> sorry about that. You're okay. Um, you know, growing up, you know, I didn't know honestly what fears or nerve or anything was just with the, wow. the, the childhood that I have with the brothers and and just being around dad. And it wasn't until uh, my freshman year in high school, uh, I actually kind of started fighting bulls probably younger than most people. I was about yeah. 12 years old when I was starting to step around. I was sneaking away to some practice pins. <laughs> and once dad and mom found that out, you know, they did nothing but support it. And but I got in a pretty bad wreck when I was 15, and it really opened my eyes what the sport can and could do uh, to somebody. And uh, I'll be honest, you know, that honestly could have ended my career. And I truly believe the only thing that really saved it was, you know, accepting Jesus into my into my life and uh, having him be my Lord and Savior. And the kind of long story short on my testimony was I was trying to get out of this funk and trying to come back and and get back into the bullfight and try to get my mind right. And I was just really battling with a lot of fear and a lot of nerves and, and just, you know, the unknown. And, uh, you know, there was a rodeo Bible camp in Matitsi, Wyoming that was going on. And, and I signed up for that with only intentions to try to go and, and develop my bullfighting skills and try to learn and improve on that side. And, uh, little did I know it, it literally changed my life. Um, you know, I accepted Jesus into my life and, from that day on, you know, it's it's been an uphill climb and it's progressed since then. And I can truly say that I credit to that, just understanding my purpose in life, 
you know, my faith in Christ and, and that we're all, we're all made for a purpose and we all have gifts and plans and, but it's up to us to put in the work and the time to, to develop them and see them, you know, come full circle. So, um, at that point, like I said, it was the best thing I ever did in my life. And that's really where I guess my bullfighting really started to kind of turn into something <clears throat> at a young age, but I was still young enough where, you know, it, it was fun. I, I, yeah, I wanted to do it. I didn't know if it was going to be a full-time career. I didn't know if it was going to be a little bit of a hobby or stuff on the weekends. And, and, you know, I just kept going to it and God put a lot of the right people in my life. I went to college, uh, in Powell, Northwest college and coach Dell knows. Um, and you know, we had a great team, you know, Wade Sankey, who's a, you know, stock contractor, uh, been to the NFR and horses of the year. Um, Shane Proctor, who's a world champion bull rider. I mean, we had a lot of great athletes at our team and, just kept going to it, and then in 2006, <clears throat> and I back up a little bit. I owe a lot of credit to the night rodeo in Cody, Wyoming. Absolutely, um, cut my teeth there for several summers. Um, in 2005 was the first summer that I worked the whole summer. And uh, stock contractor Maury Nikki Tate uh, out of Oklahoma. You know they hired me on for that first full summer, and wow. I uh, more or less told myself if if I'm as hungry and as anxious and have the drive from January one because it's ninety two performances in a row, um, and have that same hunger desire at the end of the summer that I'm gonna go ahead and apply for my PRC card and and I did I still was craving it more than ever and so we put in for our PRC card and I got approved and you know kind of the rest is history more or less. Oh yeah. yeah. And Dusty, wow. There's, I have so many questions upon that one response mm -hmm. from you because I want to take it a little bit back further. Um, you mentioned your testimony a little bit and not a lot of people get to hear that. I thank you mm -hmm. for sharing it on the podcast because, yeah. um, I think I first heard your testimony at rodeo Houston, whenever they were doing like, I, I think it's called cowboy camp. You, you know what I'm yeah. talking about? Mm -hmm. Um, where after the rodeo, there's a group of people that go to the trailers and put on just like a gospel service, truly mm -hmm. like the Lord is there. And, um, it's a good thing that you have going you and Chuck Swisher, I think kind of headed up mm -hmm. and, um, that's good for you guys guys leading by example. But kind of going back to that, you found your your faith and you made that like your foundation and the thing that you would run on. You said like around the age 15 when you first got started and all that, was it hard for you? I mean, a lot of people in life struggle. They'll go on and off the path. They'll find, especially when they're given the opportunity for a spotlight like like, like you have. Um, they'll they'll go off and on the path. And um, I guess really what I'm asking is like, what's your best advice for that? Did you ever, did that ever happen to you? Tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> oh yeah. I mean, you know, the world we live in, there's a lot of temptations and things that can pull you away from, you know, your goals, or your desires, your, your physical goals or your spiritual goals. And so you got to have a, a sharp mind on you. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of highs and lows and ups and downs that I've learned throughout the year. And um, but ultimately, you know, I was just trying to stay more plugged into the source and the system. And, you know, I learned a lot, um, you know, going back to where I said God put a lot of the right people in my life to help keep me accountable and keep me on track. And, you know, it was a development. It was consistency, you know, uh, physically and spiritually of, uh, of wanting to grow and wanting to get better and wanting to commit to, um, whatever the path in, in life you choose. And that's one thing I really try to tell a lot of people, you know, we live in a world now where, uh, you know, they want the quick fix. They want the overnight transition and transformation. And, and it's not that, that easy, you know, you got to put in uh, a lot of, a lot of days and a lot of hours and, um, you got to build habits and then habits can turn into a lifestyle. So it takes a lot of time consistently doing something in order before it really becomes a lifestyle. So <clears throat> there's a lot of discipline, dedication, um, to whatever it is you choose in life and both spiritually and physically speaking. So, yeah, there's a lot of things I learned throughout the, out, uh, my career and, uh, you know, the things that I've learned, I've tried to pass down to the, you know, the generation below me to, you know, they don't have to do what I do, but, you know, this is really what's helped me through my career and my life and, you know, help build me into the person and the man I am today. Yeah, very well said. And I can tell that for sure, especially starting so young and being where you are today. Is there any advice really quick before I have another follow up on your other? <laughs> is there any advice you'd give yourself whenever you were now that you know what you know about life, about bullfighting? What would you go back and tell your 15 year old <clears throat> self? Man, uh, I, that's a tough question. You hear that one a lot, but I think you just got to live it you know, more yeah. than anything, you know, don't, uh, basically don't take no for an answer. And, uh, you know, growing up even through high school and with my mom and dad, you know, I, I grew up and we weren't just given a lot of stuff. We had to work for it. And, and I owe a lot of credit to my mom and dad and my, and even my brothers and, uh, extended family members that 
you know, kind of instilled that into me yeah. and that, you know, rolled over into sports and then rolled over in life and, you know, my bullfighting career and, and even my walk with God. So um, every day I wake up, I always think, you know, what can I do today that my future self will thank me for? And, you know, just try to be 1% better at least every day. And, you know, I feel that if you can have a mentality like that, you're, you're always striving to be better than you were yesterday. And, and, you know, you're putting out a good example. Definitely. Okay. Now I have to go back to what you said about, um, purchasing your, your PRCA card mm -hmm. and going through all that process. How old were you? <clears throat> first of all, Never that uh, happened. I was 19. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So yeah. you were real young and then trying to just jump into this whole contracting job. You know, you mm -hmm. didn't know what rodeo was going to book you the next year. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that experience. Cause you said once you fulfilled your, what do you say? A hundred rodeos. Um, once you did that, was it hard to get rodeos booked? Tell us about that whole process right there. Cause there's a lot of people that are stuck either mentally or physically right yeah. there. And that's one question you get a lot with younger guys, you know, fighting bulls yeah. or, you know, wanting to be a rodeo clown or specialty act. You know, I, I tell a lot of them like, once you get that card, it doesn't mean that your door is just going to be knock, you know, getting knocks on and, you yeah. know, people wanting to hire you. So you got to, you know, kind of enjoy the process, you know, just just keep true to what your goals and visions are and keep working hard and and it'll pay off eventually. I've always uh, told myself and several people, the only person that will keep you from doing something is yourself, but you got to believe it. Wow. Um, but the process, yeah, you I got evaluated and, you know, um, I grew up around rodeo, so I, I got to know some contractors um, fairly early before I even had a card. You know, Triple V Rodeo Company. Dad would work a lot down in Steamboat Springs, so I got to know Bill and Donna Larson really well. And um, so I worked some of their events when I first got a card. And then uh, Dad used to work a lot of uh, Kessler rodeos up in Montana, and I was kind of the you know on the feed crew. You know, when when he was clowning and just doing oddball jobs and just learning the sport and, you know, all the ins and outs of what goes on in a rodeo. And, um, once I got my card, I didn't necessarily book anything yet. And then we went to the NFR and they have what they call the, the NFR contract personnel, uh, convention. So usually it's the first three days before the NFR starts. And it's basically where all contract personnel, they go and basically try to sell themselves, you know, have a booth with, contact information videos brochures pictures and and a lot of the committees from around the country come there and you know re-sign contracts or look for new hot potential up-and-comers and you know you think going into there man i'm i'm a card carrying member i'm gonna book a lot of events and you don't um you know it takes time and sometimes it's who you know and being in the right place in the right time and um that year I worked the NFR cell and it was cool back then because the NFR cell was still at the Thompson Mac uh, in the morning. So got to experience the Thompson Mac at an early age. And, you know, I remember uh, Shorty Gorm was there, uh, Hollywood Yates and a couple, I think Daryl Diefenbach, a couple of the other wow. guys I really looked up to. and Legends. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I just remember him telling me that, hey, when you're in there, you know, fight everything and go to everything. And, and I did. And I just wanted to show the contractors and whoever was there bidding and buying on these these bucking bulls and horses that you know i was willing to work and you know i was not afraid to get knocked down and get back up and so after the sale uh, Dwayne kester come up to me and and booked me for their summer run in montana so i had a few events um you know out of the gate um but i i would go to a lot of bullfights every ever i went i i credit a lot of it to the bullfight the freestyle part of my career to where I where I am today. Just the fact of, you know, I'm not scared to go to anything. Um, I'm not worried if one's wanting to, you know, chase me around, try to hook me. Um, and those were events that you could enter. You didn't have to get hired. So um, through the bullfights and that, um, you know, open up some job opportunities. You know, I got to go to Denver Stock Show and Rodeo for the bullfights, which led me into in 2008. I worked part of the rodeo. And then through there, I booked uh, Greeley uh, Stampedes Extreme Bulls. Um, cool. And then Fort Collins used to have a rodeo at the end of the season that I booked through that as well. They were there and they liked what they saw. So, you know, it, it definitely helped. And I tell a lot of kids nowadays that you don't have to go be a competitive freestyle bullfighter, but, you know, go out there, cut your teeth, you know, get some more exposure. The better you can be in, more fr in front of more people and, and get word of mouth going around, the better off you'll be in the long run. So you know, I credit a lot to the freestyle part and I enjoy the freestyle part too. So, um, I like protection and freestyle, um, across the board, but it was a, you know, it was a process, you know, it took some time to develop and get some good rodeos, but you know, I just yeah. kept, you know, 
kept thinking that, you know, this could turn into something great and I don't want to be the guy, regardless if I win, lose, or draw, that when I retire and hang up my cleats that I can look back and say I gave it everything I had and, and I can be content with that. I would say that you definitely have given it all you had throughout <laughs> your entire career. And we'll get into a little bit why I think that later. But I want to go back to what you mentioned, the PRCA convention. That was mm -hmm. a There was a fun video that went around this past year yeah. of you and Cody Webster. Um, you had like a, a cloth or some, the wild rag, mm -hmm. and Cody flipped over a guy. And, uh, that man was Manu. That oh, was Manu, okay. the bull jumper. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, sorry mm -hmm. about that. Yes. I loved that video. Mm -hmm. And it seems like even though you guys were there, you mentioned selling yourself. That's kind of essentially why you're there, why mm -hmm. you pay the money to have the booth to book the rodeos but is it is it just fun being there in that room and having the camaraderie of knowing like you guys are friends yes mm -hmm. you have to quote unquote compete against each other just like rodeo competitors mm -hmm. whenever it comes to booking rodeos but what's the camaraderie like not only at the convention but I mean all your all year around because you could work one rodeo with this guy and then go mm -hmm. to the next rodeo and, and not get to work with them so what's the camaraderie like between all the bullfighters yeah well just the sport of rodeo I think the camaraderie is second to none um yeah. you know just a great you know it's like an extended family um, but with the convention, you know, there's, I get people ask me all the time, why do you still go to convention? Like you're booked up. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm blessed with a great career and, and, and some good scheduling of rodeos, but I still like going there to just see everybody, um, you know, see all my committees. You can, you know, do a lot of business, you know, in a more controlled environment, you know, Vegas can get pretty hectic depending on where you're at. And, um, also, you know, just still being presentable and you know if they want a new rodeo maybe comes along and you know I can make it work great but also I like to you know there's some really good hands that that are coming up you know there's a kid that comes to mind you know Austin Ashley that is one of the the sharpest kids that is one of the younger kids going right now and so it's opportunities like that that if a contract comes up and is looking to hire somebody that's younger and give them you know some rodeos and that I like to try to help direct them to the right guys and you know help their career out a little bit because when you're starting out you don't know a lot of people right and the pr side of it and you know your public relations it, it can be hard to talk to strangers at times so yeah. just kind of break the ice for them and and get them introduced to certain people or if there's a rodeo that i have that they're bringing in a new guy that i know i like to try to help make that connection that introduction mm -hmm. and you know just ease it into uh you know the relationship they're fixing to develop so I enjoy the whole thing of it, you know, being part of the NFR um, is is pretty special. Those two weeks are what everybody strives for every year to get to, and yeah. um, but to kick it off with the convention and, you know, get to see all your buddies and, you know, just kind of reminisce because when we're rodeoing, we have a lot of fun and get to hang out a lot, but there, you know, yes, we're doing business, but, you know, we're not having to rush to a performance. We're not having to rush to a meeting or anything like that so we can kind of catch up and check in on their family and how the year's been and you know and yeah I think it's just all part of it I enjoy you know getting together with the, my rodeo crew and uh just cutting up and you mentioned you know just speaking up for any upcoming up and comer whenever you can I've got to commend you for that because that's hard to do there's a mm -hmm. lot of people that would want to keep to themselves and make sure that they're covered first and um that's probably what makes you up there with the legends you're you're a really good person in and out of the arena and kind of along those same lines there's been a lot of rodeos that you've gotten to do is there any rodeo that you haven't gotten to do that you want to do because <laughs> you've gotten to do so many I mean Cheyenne have you gotten to do Calgary no, and um, honestly, if there's one that I could st still work that I'd like to, it'd probably be Calgary. Okay, um, yeah. Um, but it was pretty cool. I, I, one of my best friends, Nate Justice, he he actually got the contract to go up there last year, and, and mm -hmm. I'm sure he'll be a mainstay there for a lot of years. And of course. So I can't, you know, going back to the, the younger guys or even the the more seasoned guys, um, if they're doing their job and doing a good job at it, uh, I'm for them. You know, yeah. there's guys that say, oh, they got to pay their dues and, you know, the, you know, this and that. Well, I think that's baloney. You know, if the guy's good, young, old or whatever, um, and I'm happy for him. And, and I like seeing young guys, older guys, seasoned guys uh, get, you know, accomplishments. You know, Nathan Harp, uh, one of my best friends, you know, we're here at Fort Worth together. Um, he got to work his first PBR finals last year wow. and uh, he'll be a mainstay there for several years. So those moments like that man you just I get more excited to see their success and my success so but that just goes back to the camaraderie of the sport you know yeah. we like to see each other do well and but we're we, we hold each other accountable you know we're not afraid to kick each other in the hind end and <laughs> say hey man you need to buck up you need to step up you know get back to what you're doing and and uh, so that's what I like too is you got to be able to be coachable you got to be able to take constructive yeah. criticism and 
Um, but it's just such a great big support group. And at the end of the day, you know, you hear the quote saying, you know, you run around with five successful people, you'll be the sixth. Um, and there's a lot of truth to that. And over the years, we've there's a buddy group that we stay in contact weekly, if not daily, and yeah. sending videos and talking about bull fights and bull ridings and just life in general. So I think, you know, that that just naturally attracts to each other. Each other. It's nothing that we've really tried to build or wanted to create with certain guys. It's just people with the like, same mindset and drive and – and, and you feed off that, you know, you look at rodeo contestants that look who they're traveling with. And, you know, two guys that come to mind right now is Stetson Ryan and Kai Hamilton. You know, those yeah. two feed off each other like none other. And, man, it's it's pretty cool to see what the, they, they can accomplish and what they can do. And, you know, in the Bronco ride and all the rides that travel together. And you just see, you know, Casey Fields and Tilden when they were traveling together. It just, <clears throat> you know, when they showed up, you know, there was a presence that was known and, guys were kind of like dang it they're here you know so uh that's what i think is cool about the buddy system and um you know pushing each other to be great oh yeah and along those same lines the buddy <clears throat> system is awesome for your specific job because um you like i said i mentioned earlier you could literally be at one rodeo with someone else and at another with another and if you mm -hmm. have some tiff outside then it like you you wonder oh no will they have my back but at the end of the day they will mm -hmm. so what's that like then too like what's going through your mind when a, a bull is headed towards you or really more so a cowboy's hung up and you've got to put yourself between the bull and knowing that 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 guy over there is going to have your back what, tell me about the headspace there whenever you're in the arena fighting the bulls what all is going on what's happening yeah so i mean obviously there's you know certain guys that you know i, I enjoy working with maybe more than others um but at the end of the day i don't really fret on who's on the other side um just do the fact that i know i still got a job to do um and so at times you know i'm pretty blessed with all the rodeos i got you know i've got a lot of great guys that of i get to course. work with so i don't really have to worry about that other side you know i know they're going to take care of it but if you know i'm with a younger guy or somebody that's a little more hesitant it's just you know i got to step up i've got to lead the pack i've got to maybe cover more ground um but when you get put in an arena with with the guys that you click with, you know, and I've said this to several people, and I'm not afraid to say it whenever to whoever, but you know, the the if I can pick one guy to work with anywhere, anytime, any place, it's that's Webb. Um, I think there's a chemistry there, and that that we bring, and that I feed off him, he feeds off me, and and you know, you just watch videos of us. Uh, you know, there's not a time that we're not having fun, and and that's when it gets really fun. You know, you're stepping in there in a unpredictable uncontrollable situation with a very large animal and a lot of things that can go haywire and uh, we're just laughing and cutting up and having fun and I know if if I get down I'm not going to be down long and if he gets down he knows he's not going to be down long and and there's other guys too you know harp and, and justice and them guys you know there's just a a tier of bullfighters out there that I think that are just they put in the work every day. They they think it, breathe it, eat it, sleep it, love it every day. And and those are the guys that you see that are, you know, busy from January one to December thirty first, and and you know always looking to raise the bar, always looking to get better. And I, and everybody that I just mentioned is is giving back to the sport as well. So I think what you learn, you've got to be able to give back to you. You know, you can't be stingy. You can't hold on to something. You can't, you know think, man, I, I hope they don't get this or I'm not going to tell them until I'm done. Like you got to be confident in your own ability and and uh, want to want to uh, relay that knowledge. You know, we've been talking over the last week, Harp, and I talked to Webb and about maybe coming up with uh, more of a like a, uh, like a, a clinic of, you know, a seasoned experienced bullfighter clinic on just – diving into bullfighting to a deeper level than normal and uh you know talking to them all have a lot of the same ideas and and thought process to it because we want to give that knowledge that we've learned and developed that people have smiths and frank and lance and all those guys miles have given us and we want to uh, play it back to the generation below us so there'll be some stuff i think in the works over the next year that where we really want to fine tune even seasoned athletes you know if we feel that we can help them i want to be that guy and and i want to see them do more and, and do better things than i ever did
That is so good for you guys. We'll be looking forward to that because you're you're spot on with that. Everyone could use a tune up and everyone mm -hmm. can learn something from a clinic. And just because you've booked some PRC rodeos and you're going, you have some big, big names. You've maybe even been to the NFR, but you're a newbie. Mm -hmm. You still have something to learn. So that's yeah, really exactly. cool. And kind of going back to that, you mentioned um, when when you get down, they, the other one knows they're not going to be down that long. And and this is like a true testament. This truly happened to you in your life in 2021 mm -hmm. at, the, at your 129th in a yeah. performance. You'll never forget it when um, your mm -hmm. life kind of changed and momentarily for for a hot second because mm -hmm. your leg was broken mm -hmm. very bad. Tell us about that that situation and how it was important to have each other. And I think even I think Bryce Redu was working that was it? Uh, was no, he? it was Nathan Harp and okay. Cody Webster. Nathan, yeah. he got to step in and um, mm -hmm. kind of fill fill a void too during the mm -hmm. the perfs whenever you had to go out. So tell us about all that whole experience. Yeah, it was you know it, it de definitely changed uh, the outlook for 2022. Um, but yeah, in the ninth round in 2021, uh, Braden Richardson um, got a bull from Phenom Genetics, uh, Bouchon, a great money bull. They went a lot of money on him, and <clears throat> B Rich, you know, he was kind of buggered up going to that round, but he ended up winning the round on the bull, uh, which was really cool. Um, and just a routine gap that I've done many, you know, hundreds, hundreds of times. And what is that? A routine gap. Just basically putting yourself between the bull and the bull rider, okay. um, you know, and, and create more exposure to yourself and the bull rider. And I stepped in there and the bull swung around there to hook at me. And when he did, he stepped on the side of my leg and everything happened so quick. And But as soon as I felt the pressure on my leg, I really tried to roll my knee in the direction where my leg would, would actually bend. But he just had too much weight on the side of my leg already. And um, instantly, you know, I mean, everybody knew right away, but I mean, you heard it, I felt it. And, uh, I just remember when I looked down, you know, my leg was <laughs> pointing in a direction it wasn't supposed to. So oh. those types of injuries, you know, it, rodeo is a game of injuries. It's, yeah. you know, you've heard it said before, it's not, uh, you know, if you, uh, get hurt. if you get hurt, it's when and how bad. Yeah. And, you know, everybody that was present or watching on TV could instantly know that, something bad just happened. You are not okay. And, yeah. you know, mentally, when you look at something like that, <clears throat> in a, uh, a limb of your body is pointing in a direction it's not supposed to, it can definitely <clears throat> play games in your head. Yeah. Um, but for me, you know, I just remember instantly when I looked down, I just, I just remember saying, Jesus, 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 heal in Jesus' name. And I uh, just wow. really tried to just keep a peace about me about it. And um, obviously Webb and Harper there and, you know, I, I didn't have a care in the world. I knew I could stay laying down and they rolled that bull to the out gate. And obviously then the just sports medicine team, Dr. Tammy Freeman, they come in and assisted me. And I just really tried to, like I said, keep calm and, and just was trying to breathe through it all. And I just remember, you know, when they got me on the board and were packing me out, there was a picture that was going around, um, as they were packing me out. And I can just remember, uh, <clears throat> gazing around the crowd um, for a quick second, and I just thought, I'm, I don't want this to pre predict the last time I, uh, that I stepped foot in this arena. And so the journey began. Um, it was a long, long, hard-fought journey, a lot of U-turns. Um, I had to have a double surgery. They had to redo the surgery a month into it. So that that was a that that was a bit of a heartbreaker. But you know, for me, ultimately, that that hurt the most. That the the, the Physical pain was there, but the, the emotional heartfelt pain, I think, overruled it just due to the fact that I knew Webb and Harp could finish out the 10th round, no problem. Yeah. But I, I wanted to be there. And uh, and you were, weren't you, on the buck and shoots? Like, didn't well, you Well, they, they didn't let me to the buck and shoots, but yes. You were watching I, uh, backstage or something. Yeah, I talked yeah. myself out of the hospital to <laughs> go watch the last round. and. You know that's insane, right, Dusty? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, Carla Harrison, she was the one that was checking on me. She's a gem. Um, why John was still working the finals, and she was really wanting to take me to the hotel and not the arena, but I was pretty stubborn, and I was like, no, I'm going to the arena. Uh, I'm going to be there as and be there for as much as I can be there for. But even that night, I just kept trying to <clears throat> just have the faith that, you know, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be healed and I'm going to fight bulls in the 10th round. And I actually even had a dream that night that uh, I got to the arena and I was in a boot and Webb and Harp hit my gear bag. They weren't good. <laughs> and I was like, come on, guys, I, we're about we're about to have to fight bulls. And, and I just, that was one thing that I made a point every day. I woke up believing that, that day and the next day that I was going to be ready to go. And 
you know, it was longer than I wanted, yeah. but it was, you know, all part of God's plan and, and part of the story. And, and I told myself, you know, this is going to benefit me. You, you really find out your true character, I think, on the other side of adversity. And so I learned a lot from it. I developed my character a lot from it. But I, I told myself this could change the trajectory of just one person's life, help them out some way, somehow, that it was totally worth it. And, uh, you know, God really showed up through a lot of it, um, through the highs, through the lows, and just a great support system. And like I said, I owe a lot to uh, Tandy and the Justice Sports Medicine team, um, uh, Kevin Kevin Taylor, the, my therapist that got me going, um, and John and Carla. I mean, they were – if I didn't talk to them – Every four hours, you know, uh, I'd be lying. You know, they were checking in, and they wow. actually stayed with me the four extra days. Um, and oh, a lot to Mr. Gong and Ryan Growney. They put me up uh, at the South Point, and, and they ended up flying me home. And they just took care of me. So just going back to the camaraderie and just the yeah. tight-knit family that Rodeo is, um, you know, they really – took care of me through it all and uh, oh, a lot to Maureen Nikki Tate. Um, I went there and actually more or less kind of rehab and relax for them first couple weeks as I was getting biased and they took care of me. And I, I can be, those who know me, I'm, I can be pretty independent. I can get pretty stubborn, hard headed of, I don't like to be waited on and, but I'll do anything for anybody. And so that was a really hard challenge for me because I physically couldn't do a lot of things. And so it was, it was a lot of growing in my patience and uh, just in trying to enjoy the process. And through that, I really have really reflected even more on the process and finding more joy in the process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it tells us in his word in James that, you know, consider it joy when we go through trials and tribulations because the testing of our faith will produce that endurance. And, and to me, that was just like, all right, you know, I'm going to take each day and I'm going to... My goal was to show up to therapy and have Kevin go, man, wow. And there was a lot of days it was like that, and there were some days it wasn't. But mm -hmm. I just, you know, kept trying to, you know, do everything I possibly could. And, you know, the timeline was was a pretty big gap. They said anywhere from 6 to 12 months uh, to, to be back, and I wasn't going to accept that. And there was a lot of people that thought he's out for the year or this could end his career, and that was just – putting another log on the fire for me. Yeah. Um, I he wasn't going to take no that. for an answer. And I knew there was more to the story. And I just, you know, whatever was dealt to me, I was going to accept and and hit it head on. And like I said, through the great team and the support system, we were able to come back in four and a half months. And my first pro rodeo back was Reno that year. And when I showed up, there was a lot, <laughs> a lot of people were like, uh, are you sure? And I was like, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm ready, you know, and, Going back on, you know, people to work with, I had Webster there working with me. So, again, uh, I wasn't worried at all. Um, you know, he definitely carried more of the load as we, we got to rolling and starting. But uh, yeah. it was just having the confidence in the sports medicine team, the Justin team, uh, Kevin, and having Webb, you know, on the other side. I, I didn't have a worry in the world. So um, it was it was a journey. But like I said, uh, it's all part of the story. And, um, and you, you got to take the good days and the bad days and, and make the best of them. Of course. And you've done a great, a phenomenal job of that. I think a lot of people that get injured in rodeo, even just as competitors, look to you and your success story of like, okay, you know what? Mentally, I can do this. I know mm -hmm. we've talked with uh, Tim O'Connell here on the podcast about mm -hmm. his, overcoming his so shoulder and all of that. And um, I don't know how you guys do it, quite honestly, without the Lord, without God. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm very, very, very proud and humbled to sit here and hear this story as well. And um, before we were running out of time, there's so many questions about that. But I've got to move on to 2024 plans and mm -hmm. everything now, because obviously you're back and go and you're in full swing. You were just at the NFR. Mm -hmm. So you you actually did the 2022 NFR, didn't you? Didn't you? Come? Yeah, 22. And then, yeah, that 20, was the, yeah. The, the really cool thing about the story. You know, the ultimate goal was to get back earlier or the ultimate goal was to get back to the finals. But yeah. Obviously, you know, I really try to focus on the each day, you know, um, not really focusing on the finals, but magnifying and maximizing my time each and every day. And, uh, you know, obviously that was in the, the, the back of my mind. And mm -hmm. to be able to get that call that year um, in 2022 was was pretty emotional. Um, it was, like I said, it brought back, you know, from the first time I got the call to just everything I've been through, it was, it was all worth it. And so to get to go back in 2022 with what I sustained in 2021 and 
step back in that arena for the first time was pretty special. And I remember you're just posting about it on social. You were wanting to tear up uh, talking about it, mm-hmm. um, that whole journey there, because you're right, you're out for four and a half months. Your leg was literally the other way. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of it, you were like, no, 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 I'm going to be at the NFR. And you did. You made it. Mm-hmm. And then to even say you, you did a whole 2023 season, NFR was good there. Um, now we're 2024. Mm-hmm. What are your plans? I know you have a lot of rodeos booked. So tell us about what Dusty's going to be doing this year. Yeah, so 2024 is not going to look a whole lot different. Um, we've got a lot of the same rodeos again. We're here in Fort Worth uh, right now for the Stock Show and Rodeo, and I've been here since 2009, and this this rodeo's meant a lot to me in my career. Um, you know, I've been been here for the majority of my career, and uh, Mr. Barnes and Cal and the crew, you know, they, they put faith in me enough to hire me in 2009, and, you know, I've said it a lot, and I'll say it again that this – rodeo itself especially when we were in old format and the old will rogers uh we used to do 34 performances in 20 days so we did a lot of two and three perfs a day um for several years and you know this rodeo has really built me into the bullfighter and the man i am today so oh a lot of credit to mr barnes for you know sticking his neck out and wanting to hire me in 2009 and but yeah we're here in fort worth and we go to a couple bull ridings into tucson and houston and then the spring run and the big summer run, you know, kicking off at Reno. So um, a lot of the same rodeos I'll be at, um, you know, new goals, new year, um, a lot of the same goals. Obviously, you know, we want to we wanna make it back to, to Vegas at the end of the year. But, again, you know, my main objective and focus right now is tonight uh, as we go back to the Dickies Arena in Fort Worth and taking care of the guys um, each and every night here. So that's really where I focus on just keeping it simple of that day and, and – you know, letting the rest play for itself and just work on trying to be 1% better every day. And that's good that you really do take it day by day. Mm-hmm. Um, before we go, I have to let you know, I did a few days ago on social media, I asked people, you know, I'm getting ready to start season two. Who do you want to see? And a lot of girls said Dusty Tuckness. But their <laughs> question for you, are you ready for this? Yeah. We have to keep it real on the Kick Your Boots Let's podcast. Are you single? And in mm-hmm. 2024, will you find a girlfriend? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm single. And uh, like I said, New year, new goals. So uh, we'll see if 2024 <laughs> is the year. <laughs> okay, ladies, all you out there that requested there that, go. there you go. <laughs> Slide up in his DMs. That's no. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, Dusty, you're a solid man. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. We've learned a lot about you, and I feel like you've shared a lot that you really haven't gotten to share mm-hmm. with most people. So we appreciate that. And anyone that wants to go find Dusty to learn more about his um, bullfighting, really anything, you can find him at Dusty underscore Tuckness on most social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, you can Google him, <laughs> whatever you want to do. Uh, you, you'll be able to learn more, but, um, just a solid guy, you guys, and, um, has a really good message to share within the rodeo industry. And you know what? We're cheering you on as an endorsee of team, Justin, we're so proud of you. And we hope that you make it up to the NFR again, another time. It's going to be awesome. And we'll be cheering for you throughout the rest of the year. And guys, if you're listening, if you like this episode, please feel free to like subscribe, share it with your friends. If there's any questions you want us to ask Dusty, feel free to comment below, let us know, and we will send them his way. Thank you so much for listening to the kick your boots up podcast. Thanks for joining us on kick your boots up. I'm your host, Taylor McAdams, and we can't wait to share the next story of the West. Until then, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Follow us on social media at Justin Boots to keep up with our next episode. And we'll see you the next time you kick your boots up.